Hi, my name is Steve Jaynes, and welcome back to this audio class on how to read the Bible for understanding and power. This is the More Abundant Life podcast, episode number 360, Because I Go Unto the Father, part two. In this episode, we will look at what we have because Jesus Christ did go to the Father, what he made available for us today, how we are made righteous, our sins have been forgiven, and now we have eternal life and so much more. Let's go to Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Because Jesus Christ has gone to the Father. Jesus Christ in in the Gospel of John is saying, I'm going to the Father. I'm on my way. It's coming. These guys are going to come up over this hill and they're going to arrest me and I'm not going to be with you anymore. He's telling them. He's trying to comfort them and give them the good news that this is what God has called ever since Genesis 3.15. And in Romans chapter 1, in verse 1 it says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scripture, as it was written, as we've been reading about today, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by what? The resurrection from the dead. God put his stamp of approval on what Jesus Christ accomplished by raising him from the dead. By raising him from the dead. Look at verse 16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jew first, by religion, the Judean first, by religion, and also to the Greek, which is everybody else. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. It's revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by believing. By faith, by believing. The just are going to live by believing in what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. By believing that Jesus Christ did a good enough job. When, when, when anybody thinks that they have to do something more, what they're saying is Jesus Christ didn't finish the job. He almost did, but he didn't quite finish it. I have to do a little bit more. But that's not the truth. The truth is, he did it. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 22. And it says, even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith or the believing of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that do what? Believe. Believe, for there is no difference. Okay, here's the whole scoop right here. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. That word propitiation means a payment in full through believing in His blood to declare His righteousness for for, for the remission of sins or the forgiveness of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. I just want to look at this verse 25. It says, whom God has set to be a propitiation, a payment in full. Jesus Christ was the complete payment, the satisfactory payment, the ransom for many through faith or believing in his blood. Now what that means when it says blood, blood is used here as uh, a part of the whole thing, meaning his death. It wasn't just that he pricked his finger. It was that he shed his blood in death. By his death, God made his righteous servant, Jesus Christ, to take on 
all our shortcomings, he was the ransom for many by his death. God uses the word blood here as a part of the whole. I believe to tell us what happened without being as violent as he could be. To declare his righteousness for the remission or the forgiveness of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. What God requires of us is simply this, to believe that Jesus Christ did the work. That's all we have to do. We believe regarding Jesus Christ in his accomplishment that Jesus Christ do the work. Yeah, I, if you believe that, you go, I believe that. So I'm going to say, I believe that. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 5. It says, But to him that worketh not, okay, that's me, to him that worketh not, but, but believe on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, or his believing is counted for righteousness. You are counted righteous because you believe that Jesus Christ did what God's word said he did. You believe that Jesus Christ accomplished it all for us. You believe that Jesus Christ has gone to the Father. You believe that it is counted towards you for righteousness. Righteousness means to stand in the very presence of God without any sense of sin, guilt, shortcoming of any kind. In other words, if this was God's house, you could walk right through the door and right into the living room and say, Hey God, how's it going? And he says, Good, have a seat. What's up? That's the presence we have with God. Righteous presence with God. Nothing to be feared. Jesus Christ accomplished it all for us. Verse 6 says, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of of the man unto whom God imputes righteousness without works. Nothing you can do. God just gives it to you. Verse 7 says, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are what? Forgiven. And whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. You know what that means? He doesn't even look at it. He doesn't even look at the sin. Doesn't impute it. Why? Because you confess that Jesus Christ accomplished it all for you. Because Jesus has gone to the Father. He took all that on Him. All our sin, all our shortcoming, all our diseases, all our sicknesses, all on Jesus Christ. Now this section here, talking about David is written also in Psalms. It's written in Psalms 32. One, and We don't have to go there, but it's written also in Psalms. It's in your notes. Uh, Psalms 32, uh, 1 and 2. This is written about David. And David says, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord would not impute sin. And David wrote this after what I'm going to tell you about now. David was the second king of uh, Israel. Up on his palace, one day he was walking around the top, and he looked down and he saw this girl taking a bath, Bathsheba. She was very pretty. He says, who's that girl? He said, that's Bathsheba, that's Uriah's wife. He says, bring her to me. He's the king. They bring her to him. They get together for a while. This could be a soap opera. <laughs> they get together for a while, and she gets pregnant with uh, David, the king's baby. And she tells David this. And David says, oh, you know what I'm going to do? He calls in the captain of the army and he says, Listen, tell Uriah to come home. So Uriah comes home, right? 
and he, and he says, give him, a, give him a little furlough, give him a little time off. So Ariar comes home, but he doesn't go in and see his wife. He sleeps at the palace door on the stoop. And David goes, so did Ariar make it home? He's talking to the captain. He goes, no, he didn't go home. He just stayed at the, the palace gate. He goes, well, why did he do that? He says, well, he's not going to go visit his wife or his family while his troops are in arm's way. He doesn't think it's right. He thinks he ought to stay with his troops. He goes, man, what am I going to do now? He won't go in and see his wife. She's pregnant. He says, okay, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to take a rider and put him into the fiercest battle possible. And when the battle starts going really bad, pull back. And so the captain of the army does that. And they attack the Philistines. And Arias is right there at the front line, and someone drops something on him and kills him. The army pulls back. And the army suffers a little loss. And Arias is killed. He's killed by unbelievers. And so the captain comes back to David and says, Dave, we, we didn't do so good today. We started losing some in the war. But Ariah's dead. So David doesn't get on them too hard about not doing well that day. And then, well, since Ariah's dead, he goes down and gets Bathsheba and brings her up to the palace to live with him. By the way, you know, he can have as many girls as he wants. He's the king. And he has a coffee buying. So she's up there in the with him. And there was a prophet in that area by the name of Datham. And he goes to see Dave. He goes, Dave, i got a story for you. He says, you won't believe what's going on in this kid. And then he says, well, I'm the king. Tell me. He says, well, there was this guy who had one sheep only one sheep and he loved this sheep and he'd take that sheep and he'd hold him in his arms and pet it and he'd take that sheep and you know bring him to bed with him you know I mean he just really took care of that sheep and he loved that sheep and a neighbor of his who had hundreds of sheep had a friend come visit him and he went and he grabbed that one man sheep and he took him and he slaughtered him for his friend and David got mad he says tell me the man tell me who did that I will take him and tear him a new one uh, who was the man and Nathan said you are the man you going around having old Uriah killed by unbelievers and taking Bathsheba to be your wife you're the man David goes you're right I am the man and he goes to God and he prays for forgiveness he prays for forgiveness and that child dies I don't know why but it does he prays and prays and the child dies his next son became was uh, Solomon became the third king of Israel. But it says in the Bible that David was a man after God's own heart. Was he doing God's will and being of God's own heart when he was out messing around with Bathsheba and having his her husband killed in the front lines? No, he wasn't. But David wrote this here. It's two verse six. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputes righteousness without works saying blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin David blew it in big way what he did was absolutely wrong but he was a man after God's own heart. As soon as he figured out it was wrong, he changed his heart and wanted and went hard to God and became a, a man after God's own heart. And you know what it says about David? David believed that Jesus Christ would come and that Jesus Christ would fulfill the requirements for all a man's sin, 
shortcomings, sickness, and disease. He believed that. And he believed in Jesus Christ. And because he believed in Jesus Christ, his sins were forgiven. How big is God's forgiveness? How big is God's deliverance? David's the one that wrote what we just read here in Romans. We've got to see how big God's forgiveness is for us in our life. Let's go to chapter 5, verse 5. Pretty neat stuff, huh? Pretty big how God, He forgives our iniquities, our sins. Look at verse 5. It says, Hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is what? Given to us. There's another translation, I believe it's Weymouth, that says, The love of God floods our hearts. It flooded our hearts by the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, which is given us. Verse 6 says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, that's us. Remember what I read in Romans is all men have sinned and come sure of the glory of God. That's the truth. But it says here, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. See, there, there are people, I guess, that would take the bullet for the president think he's a good guy, they sign up, I'll take the bullet for him. So they do it for a good man, but it says here that we were ungodly. We were, and all have come short of the glory of God. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He was the ransom for us. He did it. He said, I'll do it. I'll do it for him much more than being now justified by his blood and remember blood is just the part for the whole we shall be saved from wrath through him for if when we were what enemies back when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son much more than being reconciled we shall be saved by his life. When we were enemies, ungodly, Christ died for us. Not when we were good enough. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received an atonement, or a one-ment. You could take that word atonement and just pull it apart and put at one meant we are at one with God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ therefore as by one man's sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned that one man who are they talking about Adam for until the law sin was in the world right but the sin is not imputed when there was no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Moses brought the law. Even over them that had not sinned after the similitude, or in the manner in which Adam transgressed, who is a figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the what? Free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, because of what Adam did, many be dead, right? Much more the grace of God. And look at all these much mores. Much more the grace of God. The gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto what? Many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift for judgment. For by one to condemnation... But the free gift is of many offenses unto what? Justification. Justification. What's it say? Of many offenses. How many times can you have an offense? 
Many. Unto what? Justification. For if by one man's offense death reign by one, here it is again, much more they which receive an abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by what? One, it says, the gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness. Your sin, gone shall reign in life by one Christ Jesus. Verse 18 says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all to what? Condemnation. Because of what Adam did, sin was in the world, and it came to every man for condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came, un came unto all men unto what? Justification of life just as though you've never sinned just as though you've never sinned for as by one man disobedience many were made sinners so by the obedience of one shall many be made what righteous, righteous. we are righteous because of what Jesus Christ accomplished for us well we have to believe as that Jesus Christ did it we have to believe in his accomplished works. Did he do it? If we believe that, we are made righteous. Not because you did anything to become righteous. Verse 20 says, Moreover, the law entered that, that the offense might abound. You know what that means? You know what the law did? It pointed out the sin. It was like, there's sin. There it is right there. There's the sin. You can't do that. Remember the stuff? The Ten Commandments stuff? That's sin. You can't do that. I pointed it out. There it is. But where sin abounded, grace did what? Much more. One of those much more abounded. So as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto what? Eternal life by Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus Christ paid it all for us. Go to Romans chapter 8 verse 1. Okay, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. The rest, the last part of that verse is scratched. That is the whole verse. There is how much more condemnation? A little. None. None. No to them which are in Christ Jesus. That's us. Go to verse 28. It says, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. That's us. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. We're going to be just like His Son. Pretty good that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Who was the firstborn among many brethren? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Who's the rest? Okay. Us. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also, he also called. And whom he called, he also justified, just as though you have never sinned. And whom he justified, then he also what? Glorified. Glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And this is like a cheer in my mind. Every time I read it, it's a cheer. It's like, if God be for us, who can be against us? No one, no one, no one. It just comes out in my head. I can't stop it. He that spared not his own son. God didn't spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things because of what he accomplished? The toughest thing that we'll ever do in our lives is to believe in his accomplished work. But if we do, we get the righteousness, the sanctification, the forgiveness of sins. We get all that just by believing that he did that for us. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Is it God that justifieth? Nope. 
Who is he that condemneth? Is it Christ that died? Yea, rather is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who maketh intercession for us? See, right now, Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. There is nobody so low down that his arms aren't underneath them. There's nobody so high up that God's and Jesus Christ's arms are not above them. Or anyone else so far to the left or to the right that God cannot take care of them. Jesus Christ maketh intercession for them. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. No way, no way, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Jesus Christ accomplished it all with that love, that love that he had. He laid down his life, being nailed to the tree because of love. He loved us. He loved God. He was obedient to what God wanted him to do. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We've got it. And nothing can separate us from that love of God, which, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Go to Philippians. We're here in Romans. Go through Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, chapter 3, verse 9. It says, And being found in Him, not having mine own righteousness. See, what Paul is saying is, I am found in him not having mine own righteousness. Not that I did everything so wonderfully. Not that I, have, I saw all the rules and regs and I've done them all perfectly. That's not what he's saying. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith or the believing of Christ. The righteousness of God, which is, by, which is of God by faith faith or believe in. We just believe that Jesus Christ accomplished it for us. Go back to 1 Corinthians. Uh, we go back through Ephesians, through Galatians, then uh, Corinthians, first, uh, 2 Corinthians, then 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 and 31. We're going to get there. And this stuff is pretty cool, huh? We are righteous because Jesus Christ took it upon Him. God didn't ask any of us to do it. He didn't ask us to be good enough. He didn't say, here's the bar, you've got to reach it. He said, if you could just jump this high, then I'll give it to you. He said, don't even try, Jesus Christ did it for you. Verse 30 of chapter 1 says, But of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us. He just made unto us what? Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption are made unto us that according as it is, as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. In what Jesus Christ accomplished for us. None of us can say, I've done it. But what we can say is, praise God, Jesus Christ did it, and now I have it. And we glory in the Lord. We glory, not in our work. You know what? If it was by works, you know what I could do? I could say, I, I had a lot more sin than the rest of you guys. I was really bad. And so, look at, look at what God forgave me for. I'm better than you. You know what I mean? Or, I could say, you know what? I only had one sin my whole life. That little one, I'm better than you. But no, 
We all sin and come short of the glory. We all had different levels, but we don't glory in that. We glory in that Jesus Christ made it available for us. We are righteous now. Right now, we're righteous because of what Jesus Christ accomplished for us. And that's a great thing. In the next episode, The Power of the Holy Spirit, we will learn that Jesus taught the Scriptures so that His disciples could understand them and have the power of the Holy Spirit.